Welcome to the Community Living Education Project's Sharing Possibilities for Community Connections Learning Event. The Community Living Education Project, also known as CLEP, is a program through Rutgers School of Public Health. CLEP is committed to providing individual guidance, mentoring, and education regarding community living resources for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities living in the state of New Jersey. The CLEP team, many who are family members ourselves, can serve as a bridge for families whose loved ones may be seeking residential supports outside of the family's home. Today's webinar, Supported Decision Making Made Practical, is being presented by Michael Brower, Attorney and Legal Director for Disability Rights New Jersey. To ensure the highest sound quality possible, all attendees will be muted during today's event. To interact with the host or presenter, please use your Q&A option on the bottom of your screen. Topic-specific questions will be addressed as long as time allows. For consideration to all of our attendees, we encourage you to keep your questions as general as possible. At this time, I would like to welcome today's presenter, Michael Brower. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Melanie, and good afternoon, everybody who's joined us today. Um, I'm very happy to be invited here to talk a little bit about supported decision-making and guardianship, how those two interact. Um, this is a, um, you know, really a, a focus area of mine, um, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So um, let me just start off by uh, introducing my title slide here. Obviously, I am from Disability Rights New Jersey, as Melanie mentioned. Um, and, you know, I think this is going to be both an informative conversation and a helpful conversation. Uh, I do want to try to make sure we have time for discussion and questions and answers at the end. So as you're going, please do save any questions uh, or comments or thoughts you might have, feedback you might have for that end session. I find the more dialogue we have, um, you know, the more beneficial a session is for everybody, including myself. Um, one thing, I am a lawyer and I will be talking about legal concepts and laws. Um, but this presentation does not contain any kind of legal advice. Um, so if you want legal advice specific to your situation, um, I am going to put up a slide at the end of the session with contact information for Disability Rights New Jersey. Um, you can request assistance from us uh, by contacting our intake line. Um, and of course, if you have your own attorney that you work with, you can always consult with them for legal advice. Uh, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get started. Uh, that's me. Um, and you probably know a little bit about Disability Rights New Jersey because you've registered for the session. Uh, and you maybe know a little bit about what we do. But if you have not heard of us before, let me give you a quick introduction. Uh, Disability Rights New Jersey is a private nonprofit agency. And we're funded with private donations and grants from both the federal and state governments. Uh, we advocate for the rights of individuals with disabilities statewide. Uh, on the picture on the screen is a picture of me uh, wearing the same blue suit I happen to be wearing right now. Um, and again, I'm the legal director here at Disability Rights New Jersey. Um, because we are New Jersey's designated protection and advocacy agency, and we have been since 1994 when we came out of state government, it is our primary mission to preserve the human, civil, and legal rights of people with disabilities, to empower equality through persistent advocacy, awareness, and expertise. Uh, we provide legal assistance to individuals with disabilities in a multitude of areas such as abuse or neglect, discrimination, voting rights, access to services and supports, employment, and decision-making authority. In addition to our individual representation and systemic advocacy, we also have this really unique authority under federal law to both monitor for and investigate abuse or neglect in any facility that serves people with disabilities. Our office is organized into four distinct teams, an investigation and monitoring team that maintains the presence in all of those facilities that serve people with disabilities to make sure that we're aware of any abuse or neglect going on. We, those, that team also investigates specific allegations of abuse or neglect, uh, not necessarily on behalf of any individual or to advocate for any client, but rather to make sure that we understand and are aware of any abuse or neglect that might be occurring. We also have three legal teams that work together like a law firm. Uh, we have an employment team that addresses employment-related services like vocational rehab, work-related social security issues, and also provide advice to clients who might be facing workplace discrimination. 
We have an institutional rights team that addresses individual and systemic issues affecting people with disabilities who live in a large institutional setting, like a nursing home, a developmental center, a psychiatric hospital, for example. And finally, our community inclusion team addresses legal issues that face people who live at home, in family homes, or integrated community-based settings, like a group home or a supervised apartment. And for each of those three teams, individual requests for assistance are matched up with our agency-wide priorities, uh, and then we provide service as long as the request is within those priorities. And the service might be anything from legal advice in a case specific situation or self advocacy assistance, all the way out to full on representation in a court. Uh, for clients who have issues that don't fall within our agency wide priorities, we provide information and appropriate referrals to somebody who can help. Uh, so now that I have given a little bit of background on what Disability Rights New Jersey is, uh, I want to zoom in uh, to our topic for today. And we're going to be talking a lot about supported decision making. By necessity, we're going to have to compare and contrast supported decision making with guardianship. Uh, we're going to compare those two concepts. We're going to talk about how they work in the grander kind of decision making schemes that we all use every day. We're going to talk a little bit about powers of attorney or less restrictive alternatives to guardianship and some practical nuts and bolts kind of things that you could do, whether you're a person with a disability, an advocate for people with disabilities, or a family member. Uh, and by the end of this presentation, uh, you should be able to define what supported decision making is, differentiate it from guardianship, and identify at least two different ways that you could help promote self-determination, again, whether it's for yourself or somebody else with a disability. And regardless of whether you have a disability or not, I would like to ask, have you ever used supported decision-making for yourself? We're gonna do a little bit of a thought exercise to kind of get warmed up and get acquainted with this idea. Um, up on the screen um, are two pictures. One is a gentleman with a red jacket staring really frustratedly into the engine of his car. And the one right to the right of that is a person with a blue hat giving a thumbs up sign in front of a repaired car. This is going to be the kind of the framework for us to do our thought experiment. And, you know, it's important to remember that people make decisions all the time. And regardless of whether or not, again, you consider yourself to have a disability, it's pretty rare that you would make a decision completely independently. And the decisions that we make range from the smallest, almost insignificant, like, you know, what color tie should I wear today? To the very serious, you know, what kind of medical care do I want if I were to become gravely ill? Let's pick something in the middle, and this is where my car's pictures come in, um, and we're going to work our way through the process of decision making to lay the groundwork for our discussion. And I chose the example of a broken down car because, you know, we're in New Jersey, and most of us has either had to drive a car or ride, ride in a car at some point in our lives. Uh, it's the nature of the state we live in. Hopefully, though, this is a common experience, so we can all draw on something that we're a little bit familiar with, and it, it hits home. So here's your scenario for the thought experiment. Your car stalls on the highway while you're on a road trip. You're far from home. You don't know exactly what's going on, but all of a sudden your car is losing power and you're slowing down quickly. You don't have a lot of time before this situation gets dangerous. Remember, you're in the middle of the road and your car is slowing down. What's, now what? What's the first thing you're going to do? Maybe you decide to pull over. You put on the flashers and you call a tow truck. How would you know to do those things? Did somebody teach you in a classroom, maybe during a driver's education course? Do you have some experience as a driver or a passenger in a broken down vehicle before? If you had neither the training nor the experience, would you inherently or naturally know what you're supposed to do when a car starts to slow down? Let's say you'd make the decision to put on the flashes and call the tow truck because you remember that from driver's education or one of your parents telling you that when you first learned to drive. The tow truck shows up, tows your car to the mechanic. And remember, you're far from home, so this is a strange mechanic to you. It's not your normal mechanic. How do you decide what to do next? You probably talk to the mechanic, see if they can diagnose the problem, give you an estimate for the repair. And then you have to start thinking, well, gee, do I have the money? Is this car worth fixing? Could you make a decision, a good decision, about any of those things when you first pulled up in the tow truck? You probably needed more information than you had at the time. Maybe you let that mechanic take a look at the car, they come back to you, they tell you what's wrong, or at least what they think is wrong, and then an estimate for how much it's gonna to cost to fix. But what if the mechanic starts talking about spark coils, carburetors, fuel injectors, clutch cylinders? 
but you have no idea what any of those things are. You know, for all you know, you just ran out of gas and all you needed was a you know a tank of gas to get you the rest of the way to your destination. Or maybe something really serious, like a blown head gasket is wrong with your car and the mechanic's telling you it's gonna take thousands of dollars to repair. And you know, with just the information coming from this strange mechanic who's new to you, is that enough information for you to make a decision? You know, just knowing what they think is wrong with the car and how much they think it'll cost to fix. Maybe you seek out some support here. Maybe you call your sibling who fixes cars as a hobby. Or maybe you call your normal mechanic back home who you really trust and have a good relationship with. Maybe you need some other information unrelated to the car, like where the heck are you? How far are you from your destination? And how serious is it going to be if you arrive there late? Maybe you need to know, is there a rental car agency nearby? Before you get any of this information, again, I ask, are you in a good position to make a good decision? Uh, and ultimately, who is responsible to decide? You know, even if you put your brother, who's a gearhead, on the phone with a mechanic and they talk shop for a few minutes, you get back on the phone with your brother who says, yep, do whatever he says. He's got it, he's got it figured out. Even if you agree with that assessment, is it the mechanic or your brother who's deciding? Of course not. You're the person who's deciding what to do with your broken down car. Or maybe all of that was just too overwhelming and you decide not to decide. Your car, you know, from the get-go, coasts into the ditch, you get out, you walk away and you leave it on the side of the highway. Deciding not to decide is still an exercise in decision-making. There really is no escaping making a decision. On the screen here, I have a picture of a rusting down vehicle parked in some tall weeds. No matter how that situation with your car came out, you probably just used some form of supported decision making to respond to an unexpected problem. You got some information from an, exper from an expert, you got some explanation from them, uh, maybe you got help from a trusted communicator in the form of your brother to communicate with that expert. Maybe you talk to somebody like a sibling who can just understands how you think and your priorities, or maybe somebody who had some external information like a coworker who, you know, helped calm you down and promised you that they'll cover the big business meeting that you're going to be late for. If you had never had a car break down on you or had never dealt with a mechanic at all before, it might have been a very stressful situation and you might not have been thinking clearly. Even if you drove a 63 Dodge Dart and you've been breaking down over and over for the last 50 years, you still might have needed some or all of this help to get through the decision-making process. The same kinds of decisions come up all the time, and people very routinely seek out support. You know, people ask questions of their doctors before they do a big medical procedure. Or maybe they even just go and get a second opinion from another doctor. They may talk to friends or even strangers on Facebook before renting or moving to a new city, uh, or renting an apartment, rather, in a new city. You know, people talk with their family before they make major career decisions on taking a new job or taking a job in a new place. Uh, or even they just, you know, in all situations, consult with somebody that they really know has a level head, someone that can help them get through a situation that has stressed them out and made it impossible for them to make a good decision for themselves. You know, all of us have at some point in our lives gone through something like that. And sometimes, even with that help, consulting with our level headed guru, we make mistakes. You know, we decide on a course of action, we either don't understand all of the risks, we don't have all of the facts, or we just make a bad decision. You know, we rented an apartment in a nice part of town, turns out it's right on top of a noisy train line. Or maybe we got that bad tattoo back in the 90s and we're stuck with it for the rest of our lives. Even people with lots of resources and lots of help, right? Think about all those wealthy people who had paid and experienced financial advisors who ended up investing with Bernie Madoff and they truly didn't understand what they were getting into and lost millions of dollars. Even with all the support in the world, people make mistakes, but we're all allowed to make those mistakes. And the idea would be we learn from them so we don't make them again. In all those situations from the stalled car to Bernie Madoff, we're assuming that the person in charge of the decision-making is you. You told the mechanic to fix the engine. You consider the advice and the input you received in any one of those multitude of decisions from medical to financial. You listened to some advice, you rejected some other advice, and finally, you decided what you were going to do. That's all a description of supported decision making. And not every decision is a supported decision. Some people might seek no input on small or large decisions and decide only based on what's already inside their own brain at the moment. You know, the tie example is a good one. You look in the closet, you grab a color, kind of like what I did this morning, 
without really thinking or consulting with anybody else. Um, but usually the more consequence that comes with a decision, the more important it is, the more we tend to seek out some level of support. So up on the screen is an arrow that points from the left to the right with four colored dots. The first three dots from the left to the right are gray, and they're labeled in order, independent, supported, and surrogate. The last dot, the one all the way on the right is blue, and it's labeled substitute. We're gonna refer back to this arrow a couple times during the presentation today. Um, but for now, let's kind of go from the left to the right and talk about what this means. If you look at deciding from the perspective of who is the decider, you'll see that these things start to line up into a spectrum. That's where my arrow comes in. The more input you have from other people or the more that input matters, the further from independent decision-making we go. So we've talked about independent decision-making, grabbing the tie out of the closet, maybe not even thinking twice about it, definitely not consulting anybody else. Um, that falls all the way on the left side of my spectrum, independent decision-making here. The more input that we get, again, the further from independent decision-making we go. Um, so in both independent and supported decision-making, which we just talked about at length, right? Seeking input, support from people to either help understand, decide, or communicate. But in both of these situations, you are still the decider and you control what happens in the situation. Surrogate decision-making, the next stop down the arrow, is when someone else decides for you, but they make the decision based on your values and your documented wishes. Sometimes you might be able to overrule that decision that somebody else made for you, but not always. And in this situation, it's like someone, and this is where the name comes from, is standing in for you, that they're standing in as your surrogate. Um, so a very common example of a surrogate decision-making arrangement is a power of attorney. A power of attorney is where you, the principal, designate someone to make decisions for you, your agent, um, and they're supposed to apply whatever standards you write down in your written power of attorney document. You know, maybe you make specific instructions for them to decide on, or maybe you just give them a set of criteria and values to work with so that they think, how would you decide if they were standing in your shoes? If you move to the last dot, all the way on the right side of my arrow here on my spectrum, we're talking about substitute decision-making. Substitute decision-making is when the decision maker is a third party. It's not you anymore, that's for sure. But they're making decisions based on what they think is good for you. Uh, that decision maker might apply an objective standard, like a best interest test, where they decide what they think is best for you. They might consider your wishes in that best interest, but in all situations, that substitution, that substitute decision maker decides, not you. In that scenario we were just talking about with the broken down car, this is like if you called your brother, who's you know experienced with cars, put him on the phone with the mechanic, and after that, you literally sat in the back seat and did nothing else. Your brother took over from there. He decided you know whether it was worth fixing the car, how much they were going to pay, and you're really literally out of the conversation from that point on. Maybe he thought a little bit about what's good for you and getting you home, um, but you were no longer involved in that decision making process. Your the full guardianship. Um, is a good example of a substitute decision-making arrangement. And because guardianship is an example of a substitute decision-making arrangement where you're not involved, it's one of the reasons that we consider from a disability rights perspective, guardianship to be one of the most restrictive decision-making mechanisms because you no longer have control over decisions in your own life. And speaking of guardianship as a restrictive mechanism, if we zoom out to a global perspective, you'll see that other parts of the world have differing views on decision-making for people with a cognitive disability. So up on the screen, I have a world map. And on the world map, different, color, different countries rather are colored in with either yellow, red, or shades of blue. And the reason that these colors are relevant to us is because the United Nations sponsored a convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. And the convention says that states or countries shall recognize that persons with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. And that includes the right to support to exercise their own legal capacity and their own legal decision making. For our conversation today, we can really simplify the UN convention by saying that it outlaws removing someone's legal capacity to decide only because they have a disability. 
The convention requires the nations to modify their legal system to recognize that at least some form of supported decision making exists for people with disabilities, and especially when those disabilities affect how somebody thinks. So back to the colors. Countries in yellow on this map have signed the convention, but they have not adopted it into law. Red or blue countries have adopted the conversation where it's the law of the land. You'll see on the map that the United States of America has uh, been colored in with yellow, meaning that we've signed the treaty, but our Senate has never ratified it, and therefore it does not have the force of law here in the USA. Other nations who have that same kind of stance where they signed, they said, yeah, it sounds good, but we haven't actually adopted it into law. Uh, we're in the company of Ireland, Libya, Chad, Belarus, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Bhutan. Practically for us, that means that decision-making in the United States is not governed at the national level. It's a state-by-state -state system of laws and is not uniform across the United States. The law in Texas or Pennsylvania or New York is different than it is here in New Jersey. So some states, like Texas, have a statutory scheme to define how supported decision-making works in relation to guardianship. Here in New Jersey, we do not have a specific supported decision-making law on the books. For those other states who do have a supported decision-making law, usually they do things like address problems that people with disabilities have when they interact with third parties. So, for example, that might mean a supported decision-making law might tell a doctor that it's okay to get informed consent from a person with intellectual or developmental disabilities in order to perform a medical procedure, handle money at the bank if you're a banker, or contract to exchange goods or services so long as the person has followed the rules outlined by the state in going through the supported decision-making process. In sum, those supported decision-making laws tell third parties that it's okay to accept a person with disabilities decision as long as they've taken steps like setting up a written supported decision-making agreement and consulting with their supporters. So we've laid a little bit of groundwork. We've talked about the fundamentals of decision-making and we've gotten our international and our national perspectives. Let's turn to New Jersey and focus on how things work here in our state. Like I said, we don't have a supported decision-making statute here in New Jersey. And really what that means is that supported decision-making is whatever we make of it. Um, so that means that some doctors might recognize that a person with disabilities has, you know, informed consent, they've talked with their supporters, and when they say they want the surgery, that means they've made a decision that the doctor needs to respect. Another doctor might not agree to perform a procedure on somebody with an intellectual or developmental disability if they don't think that their patient understands the risks and the benefits of the surgery, and therefore it doesn't really have informed consent. We're going to talk in a minute about how our guardianship statutes and the courts here in New Jersey require some level of supported decision making for people with a guardianship. But for people who do not have a guardian, meaning they've never gone to court and been found to be incapacitated, we still have some rules that require accommodations to be made for disabilities. Of course, you've probably heard of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, or you may not have heard, but you should have heard about the New Jersey specific law against discrimination. Both the ADA and the law against discrimination make it illegal for people to discriminate against others because of disability. So it would also be illegal under both the ADA and the law against discrimination to deny access to medical care or to deny access to a business that's otherwise open to the general public, like a restaurant, a government office, um, or even programs um, that are operated for the general public based on disability. Under those uh, anti-discrimination provisions in the ADA and the law against discrimination, a doctor might incur some liability if they refuse to treat a patient just because they have a cognitive disability. Now let's think about that for a second. Now, what accommodations would a doctor need to provide for someone who is deaf? We wouldn't even bat an eye to learn that a doctor's office is obligated to provide, at the bare minimum, some level of sign language interpretation for someone who is deaf or a ramp if somebody uh, who's using the office uses a wheelchair for mobility. Would those be uh, um, you know, surprising to you? I don't think so. But if we're talking about someone with an intellectual or developmental disability, doesn't it seem just as you know, natural to say, well, accommodations might include um, respecting somebody's decisions or providing explanations and things that start to look like supported decision-making? To me, I don't think it sounds too surprising at all. 
And even though we don't have national or state level supported decision making laws in New Jersey, it uh, doesn't mean that supported decision making does not exist here. We talked about the anti discrimination provisions and how, as an accommodation, um, the different doctor's offices, businesses, or even the government might have to make an accommodation that includes supported decision making. Um, and, you know, we start to zoom in. We talked about decision making generally. You know, it's not all that different for people with a cognitive disability than it is for people without a cognitive disability. You know, and whether we're talking about something that's developmental disability, a psychiatric illness, uh, or even a brain injury, the difference between uh, folks who do not identify as disabled and those who do might just be how far into the routine decisions you might need support or how heavily you rely on the people who support you to make those decisions. A supported decision-making agreement might be informal where supporters get involved only when needed, or it might be more formal with a written document, you know, who's involved with a regular meeting schedule and a designation on who helps you with which decisions. On the screen here, I have a picture of former President Barack Obama seated at a conference table surrounded by advisors in the White House. This is an example, this is an example of a very formal supported decision-making arrangement, even though President Obama did not, did not identify as a person with a disability. And formal support like this could come from anywhere, right? Family and friends can be part of a formal arrangement. So could professional staff who are paid to help. And while the president of the United States might select diplomats and speech writers or treasury secretaries, you might designate caregivers or doctors, accountants, clergy, lawyers, or social workers to help you make decisions in your everyday life. The good thing about there being no statute in New Jersey is that how formal this arrangement is, is kind of up to you. Um, there are good sample supported decision-making agreements available at supporteddecisionmaking.org. I'm gonna put that link up on the screen in just a second. So don't worry about copying it down just yet. Um, and the forms when people do a written or more formal arrangement are meant to help document and clarify the role of those supporters in the arrangement so that everybody knows what their job is and you, if you're the person at the center, can reference it if you need to. On that note, beware someone who claims to be a supported decision maker for you or for somebody else. Think back to that arrow and that continuum of decision making. Remember that supported decision making revolves around maintaining self-determination. So no, nobody but you has the authority ultimately to decide. So even if your sibling recommends repairing the car, you in a supported decision-making arrangement ultimately get to decide whether or not you do it. Everyone else either supports you in making the decision, supports you in communicating your decision, or helps you to understand your decision. If somebody in the supported decision-making arrangement starts deciding for you, we're sliding away uh, from that part of the arrow and we're going more towards surrogate or substitute decision-making, something to be aware of. So, We've talked a little bit about decision-making, how we work with supported decision-making and what our statutes in New Jersey say, which is not too much about it here in New Jersey. So let's introduce guardianship into the mix to see how these two, con um, these two concepts interact with each other. To understand guardianship, you need to know a little bit about where it comes from. And like many things that we have on the books here in the law, we get our basis for guardianship from England. Uh, back in medieval England, the king or the queen was considered to be the figurative parent of all of the subjects of the land, and the people were the children. Whether they were, you know, adults over the age of 18 or not, uh, they were considered the children of the king or the queen. And like any parent, the king or the queen had a job, they had a duty to protect those people from harm if they could not protect themselves. So generally, king or the queen exercise that power to actual minor children who might be orphans, who don't have parents to watch out for them, or adults with a disability who the king or the queen through their government decided couldn't watch out for themselves. This general concept came across the ocean to the American colonies and has evolved significantly over the years since the war for independence. In their modern United States, we see this power come in various forms. In New Jersey, we have Child Protective Services, or DCPNP, who watch out for children who maybe don't have parents to watch out for them. Uh, we also see various other protection agencies like Adult Protective Services. And of course, we have our guardianship scheme for adults with disabilities who the state has decided through the courts cannot watch out for themselves. In this model, 
Remember that the power is held by the state. So when we talk about appointing a guardian for somebody, it's just that. The court, on behalf of the state, appoints a, oh, pardon, uh, appoints a guardian to carry out decisions for somebody the court has determined is incapacitated. And that's the legal term that we use. Um, but remember in this arrangement that the court is always the one exercising the authority for any particular decision. So the court can appoint a new guardian. Um, they could actually make decisions for the individual directly, or they might decide that a guardianship is no longer necessary. So this decision, remember, is all the way on the right-hand side of our decision-making arrow, where a guardian is appointed to make best interest decisions for somebody else. There's a few important limitations that we're going to talk about in just a second. But first, a couple of definitions just to make sure that we all know the rules here. Um, the most important thing when you're talking about guardianship is to know who gets appointed with a guardian. And in New Jersey, only people who are incapacitated get a guardian. Everybody else just makes decisions for themselves. Uh, in our law, uh, we've defined an incapacitated individual to mean somebody who is impaired by reason of a mental illness or an intellectual disability to the extent that they cannot govern themselves or manage their own affairs. Notice how that's a little bit circular. Someone is incapacitated if they don't have the capacity to govern themselves or manage their affairs. It really doesn't help us. It doesn't tell us a whole lot, but that's all the guidance we're going to get from the statutes. This is a pretty subjective standard in practice. Um, court rules require that to prove incapacity, two doctors need to certify or write down that a person does not have the ability to govern themselves or manage their own affairs. Um, if two doctors can present that to a court, it's pretty typical to see that the court will find for incapacity and then will appoint somebody with a guardian. Uh, guardianship statutes in New Jersey allow but do not require judges to consider whether somebody doesn't need a guardian for all areas of guardianships. It's called a limited guardianship. So it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. If a guardian um, isn't needed for all areas of decision making, then a court can appoint a guardian only for particular areas. So the court is supposed to find specifically um, whether or not somebody needs a guardian in each of the different areas of decision making. So for example, residential decision making, where to live, educational decision making, what kind of school or training to get, medical decision making, self-explanatory, whether you take a medicine and get a surgery, legal decision making, whether you file a lawsuit or not, vocational decision making, where you might work or what kind of training you might get for work, and financial decision making, how you're going to manage your money. The court could divvy those areas up, get more specific, um, but generally those are the biggest areas that courts will generally analyze when talking about whether somebody needs a limited guardian or not. Uh, remember when I said just a second ago that this is a pretty subjective standard, and really, if you can find two doctors who will certify that somebody doesn't have capacity, courts will usually approve it. Well, since 2016, the standard is actually even lower for adults who qualify for services from the Division of Developmental Disabilities. If you're approved to receive DDD services, there only needs to be one physician or psychologist who certifies that you need a guardian, accompanied by either a certification or written statement from a DDD administrator, a DDD officer, another licensed healthcare professional, or even just a copy of your IEP that's been made within the last two years. So up in the screen, I put a picture of a wide paintbrush because with this newer rule, it makes it very easy to seek guardianship over someone who's in the DDD system or painting with a broad brush. We're assuming that people who have a developmental disability are more likely to need a guardian and we have fewer protections in place. It's a little concerning from a disability rights perspective. The good news is that even people who are found by the court to need a general guardian, so I mean, we need a guardian for all those areas of decision making, they still retain some very important rights. First, guardians are required to give, quote, due regard to the preferences of the ward. And I'm gonna take a little side trip here. All of the rules in the statutes use the word ward, and what that means is the person with the guardian. It's a pretty old fashioned term. Some people are offended by it. I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm just using the language directly from the statute. Um, so like I was saying, the guardian has to give that due regard to the ward's preferences and must make reasonable inquiries to find out what those preferences are. 
The guardian also needs to encourage the ward to participate in the decision-making process to the maximum extent of their ability. And they're supposed to help the ward develop or regain higher capacity in areas where they need a guardian. That sounds a little bit like supported decision-making, doesn't it? We're talking about engaging the individual directly, involving them in the decision-making process, and giving their decision or their expressed wishes due regard. Of course, giving due regard, the language from the law, might mean listening to you, but then overruling you if the guardian disagrees with what you want. Um, and the question is, what might you do if you have a guardian, um, but they're not respecting your expressed wishes? There are some Supreme Court cases, New Jersey, that have discussed the rights of people uh, who are subject to a general guardianship, and those rights are specifically retained. Um, there's a case in New Jersey called In the Matter of MR, and it's a New Jersey Supreme Court case. I'm sorry to talk about cases, but I'm a lawyer. I can't help it. Um, but this case talks about the rights that people with disabilities have to make a decision, even if they already have a guardian. The Supreme Court of New Jersey wrote, and I'm going to quote for them for a second because it's pretty powerful language, that, quote, we are reminded that the mere fact that a person is generally incompetent does not mean that they're incompetent for all purposes. Somebody who is generally incompetent can still make choices about specific matters. And we recognize the argument that as a decision increases in importance, so should the right of the affected person to make that decision. Our goal is to permit developmentally disabled people to make as many decisions as possible while protecting them from the harmful effects of bad decisions they do not fully understand. So when you take the statute that provides for the guardian's duties to listen to you and to incorporate your express wishes into the process, to include you in the decision-making process, and the language we just heard from the Supreme Court of New Jersey, we find that there really is a duty on the guardian to encourage your participation in the decision-making process and ex respect your expressed opinions as much as possible. If your guardian disagrees with you and you feel strongly about that issue, you could go back to the court you could write to them, you could ask the surrogate to hold a hearing so that the guardian will have to prove why your opinion should not be honored. The structure of the guardianship statute still contains a lot of obligations to respect the wishes of the disabled individual. Um, there are specific court rules, and of course, if this affects you individually, let me know through the intake process um, for people to get the attention of the court so that the court can review specific guardian's decisions or even whether or not you still need a guardianship at all. So up on the screen here, I have a Venn diagram. Um, and this really is the result of this analysis. Guardianship, which is the smaller oval, and supported decision-making, this bigger oval, are not mutually exclusive. Where they overlap, in this darker blue area, people with guardians should still be involved in their own decisions. This little slice of guardianship over here, outside of the dark blue area, is really for people um, who cannot communicate their preferences, whether that's verbally, visually, or even if they had assistive technology, if they still cannot express their wishes, only then will the guardianship not involve some kind of supported decision making where the individual is involved in deciding for themselves. All right, I'm going to keep my eye on the clock and I want to make sure we have room for questions. We've defined supported decision making. We've talked about where it differs and how it overlaps with guardianship. And let's talk now about some of the practical nuts and the bolts. What can you actually do starting right now to promote self-determination, whether it's for yourself if you're a person with a disability or for a family member, or if you're an advocate for people with disabilities, uh, the people that you advocate for. So if you're in that session, in this session here, it's probably because you're at least somewhat interested in learning more about how support and decision-making might work for you or in a specific situation for you. Uh, and we've talked about how most of us, regardless of disability, use some form of supported decision-making to navigate the maze of life. For people with disabilities, where the right to decide can be taken away by the court, um, having a documented arrangement might be able to help overcome obstacles so that you don't even need to be having the conversation about a guardian. Um, and I mentioned we don't have any particular statutes, so you know how somebody might craft their own supported decision-making agreement can be however works for them. That being said, there's a few fundamental elements that you should think about if you do decide to draft up a supported decision-making arrangement. I'm a lawyer. I like things to be memorialized in writing. Uh, first, any good supported decision-making arrangement should 
define who is ultimately responsible to decide and write that down clearly. This is the decider. The decider should be the person themselves, right? So if you're the person with disabilities, it should be you. If I was the person with disabilities, it would be me. If you're the parent of somebody with disabilities, it would be your child who is ultimately the decider in a good supported decision-making arrangement. Writing it down helps remind everybody that whatever that person says goes. They're the decider. They should have the power to change the document at any time for any reason. So that includes, you know, maybe removing or replacing different supporters who are included in the arrangement. Second, we should define those supporters. It helps to be specific so that for each supporter who's involved um, to know what their role is. If they're involved in helping the decider come to the decision, that should be the core of any supporter's function. For some people, they might only have one or two supporters. Maybe it's their parents or their brother or their sister or a trusted member of their church. For others, they might have a big network, friends and families, professionals who support them, uh, even people who might be paid, you know, accountants, lawyers, for example, uh, or support staff through the, D the DDD system might be part of the supported decision-making arrangement. Everybody who's identified as a supporter should be aware of their role. They, right, they should know that they're part of an arrangement and that role should be written down. So, you know, do they gather information? Do they help break up complicated concepts down to understandable bits for the decider? Do they give their input or their advice? Or are they just supposed to be objective? Uh, it usually will help to have them sign off on the document. So they acknowledge that their participation as a supporter and that they acknowledge their commitment to support when they're actually needed. Next, it's good to define the process. How is this actually going to work? Will there be regular meetings of the supporters like an IDT meeting? Will one supporter be responsible for summoning all the others when they're needed? Or will the decider be more hands-on? Um, you know, will the decider themselves call and help when they need it? How will the decider communicate? Is it going to be by email, by telephone, by text? Um, will any of the supporters have a responsibility to keep tabs and keep check on the other supporters to make sure nobody's overstepping their role and kind of going down that spectrum? How will the supporters know when the decider has decided and the conversation is over? Writing all of that down and how it works for you will help avoid confusion later. Finally, who will communicate? Who's the communicator, if anyone, on behalf of the decider? So if the person has a disability and part of the disability is a communication impairment, will they use a trusted interpreter? Will they use a communication board or some piece of assistive technology? How will the outside world know that what's communicated is the decision that's been made by the decider and nobody else? It can be a little tricky. So you have to carefully tailor it to individual circumstances and make sure that the decider has oversight from those other supporters to make sure that uh, there's not a supporter or a communicator who's injecting their own decision into the message that goes out to the world. And practice makes perfect. We're talking about practice here. If you have never had the chance to make a mistake, to learn from that mistake or try again, you probably would never be able to learn to make decisions. And, you know, you know, real talk here, right? Many parents of people with disabilities have engaged in battles from early on in life and they've had to help secure services, fight against discrimination, or just protect from, you know, harm, like abuse or neglect. You know, certainly we know that that's a real part of the world out there. Um, and there's never a clear line that gets drawn between that essential parenting that you need to do and the transition to adulthood. So if that transition just never happens, and a parent makes all the decisions until age of 18, you know, you're pretty likely to end up with an adult who doesn't have any practical decision-making experience. So you know, no doubt someone who has never been involved with determining you know, the outcome of their own life would be pretty bad at it if you just threw them into the deep end all of a sudden as a teenager. And like our car example, back at the very beginning, you, know, you might be better equipped to call for the right kind of help and get the right kind of supports and less likely to get bamboozled by a crooked mechanic if you've been through the situation before, even if you were just an observer at some point earlier in your life. And when the stakes are low, especially when people are minor children under the age of 18, um, you know, the law gives parents that decision-making authority by default. So it's a good time to start the learning process. Know, involving children in the decision-making process as early as you possibly can, asking them to participate, to understand what's going on. Explain, you know, be explicit. How are you making decisions? Are there big decisions or small decisions? How is that working? Um, you know, and this can and should be beyond just disability-related services, you know, paying bills, balancing bank accounts, uh, writing down the shopping list, or even something as simple as getting dressed and deciding what to wear for the day. 
are all experiential things that can pay dividends later on and develop a practical background of decision making. As much as possible, you want to give some room so that decisions can be made, so can mistakes. Um, right? It's okay um, that if you're clear at the goal of building up this practical experience is to learn and to grow and to get practice, if we're talking about minor children going into adulthood, um, you know, be clear. It's okay to make a mistake. That happens to everybody. Uh, and if you don't have a disability, you're not worried that when you make a mistake, someone's going to file for guardianship. Um, but when it happens, you, time to have a conversation. What went wrong? What went right? What will happen next time so that make a better decision? And obviously, everybody is a unique individual, so you'd have to tailor those conversations and the goals. You know, if we're talking about minor children to their age or somebody's developmental status, um, how, how much experience they already have. If they're starting from zero, you don't want to throw them into the deep end. If you think a supported decision-making arrangement might be in the future, you know, there's no time like the present to get started. So identifying who those supporters might be drafting them into your service to be involved so they participate in the conversations if we're talking about childhood or even if we're talking about somebody with a guardian um, so those people can be involved in the decision making process as soon as possible so they can say seamlessly involved familiar with the individual that we're talking about um, and ready to jump in when support is needed um, and again we're talking even for adults with guardians the same principles all apply you know, guardians have a legal obligation to help develop decision making skills and to involve the individual in decisions as much as possible. Those are laws in New Jersey that are specifically required for guardians. So if you make all the decisions as a guardian without involving the person that you're the guardian for, it's hard to imagine how they might ever learn the skills they need to manage their own affairs and eventually not need a guardian anymore. And for people without guardians, um, you probably have something that looks like a supported decision-making uh, arrangement already, and you might have to make a decision for yourself whether or not it's worth putting it down in writing. All right, so I think I've covered all three of my bases, talking about supported decision-making and decision-making generally, talking about how that works with guardianship, and just now some of the most practical and essential things you can do between writing down your supported decision-making arrangement and building up a track record for making decisions with support if needed. Um, before time gets away from me, I do want to put up the contact information so that it gets preserved in the recording for Disability Rights New Jersey. Um, our physical office is currently closed due to COVID. Um, you can see I'm working from home, um, but our toll-free line is open for intake, as is the local phone number, our fax, our TTY, our email address, and of course our social media accounts uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and our website, disabilityrightsnewjersey.org. Um, with that, I'm going to turn off the slides for a second. And Melanie, if we have any questions, I have not been paying attention to the chat, but I see that there are many, many entries in the chat and maybe something in the Q&A. Michael, thank you so much uh, for taking the time and answering these questions after the presentation. It's greatly appreciated. Um, so we do actually have a lot of questions. We even have some questions that were submitted prior to the session. Um, so I encourage anyone, if you still have questions, please continue to submit those under the Q&A section of your screen. Um, Michael, can you talk a little bit about if there is an initiative within New Jersey to have supportive decision making brought to law? And if there is, is Disability Rights New Jersey involved or is there um, an organization who is leading that way? Um, so to my knowledge, there have been conversations about bringing supported decision making um, into a more structured format that it gets, you know, put into the laws of New Jersey rather than what we have now, which is kind of, the, you know, it is what you make it. Um, that being said, I don't think there's quite an organized push for it. Um, Disability Rights New Jersey doesn't lobby for the adoption of any particular law uh, or not. Um, but to that extent, our um, outreach efforts are more about educating the public about where we stand right now. I would say, though, that if you are interested in having supported decision making be the law in New Jersey, um, the thing to do is to contact your representatives in state government, whether that's the governor, whether that's your state legislatures, or your state senator, and let them know it's an important issue to you. Because unless those elected officials hear from people that that's important to them, they don't think it's very important um, and probably gets put in the back burner if the conversation comes up. Great, great suggestion. I think, um, you know, many of us saw that supported decision making was 
um, included in DDD's policy and procedure uh, manual. And I think for many, it's a new term, approach, practice, um, really um, that needs to be spoken about more often. Um, you know, I, I know that at CLEP, you know, we are really focused on offering information around all options, right? Um, and I, I think this is an option that um, also needed to be addressed. So we, again, greatly appreciate you um, starting a conversation again with us. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, do you know people specifically um, putting this into practice in the state of New Jersey? Um, are they putting this, you know, are they using the documentations that you referenced? Um, is it being put into writing and, and how is that working for those individuals? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I um, talk with a lot of different, whether they're clients of Disability Rights New Jersey, or whether I'm just talking with my fellow attorneys about, you know, cases that they're handling, you know, folks who are in the disability bar who might practice privately. Um, and there are attorneys out there um, who are very much up to speed on what supported decision making is and how it works. Um, there are, of course, attorneys who maybe are, are a little bit more old fashioned about how guardianship works. And anytime they see somebody come to them who has a disability, the flag goes up in their head, oh, they need a guardian. Um, but the attorneys who are working um, with supported decision making are doing things just like I talked about in this presentation. They're writing it down. They're talking about who are the supporters? What is their job? How will the individual use the process to make a decision if they maybe would need support to get through a particular issue? Um, and in the context of guardianship, you know, some lawyers have been pretty successful in bringing these things to the judges and convincing a judge, look, you know, my client doesn't need a guardian because they've got a supported decision-making network around them. There's no statute, there's no rules, but judge, if you look subjectively at this person, they've got all the help they need around them so they don't need somebody appointed to make a decision for them. Um, some judges are very open to that and some other judges, again, a little bit more old fashioned uh, and maybe are less open to hearing that kind of an argument. Um, but there are little toeholds starting to be made in the practice in New Jersey. And hopefully by getting the word out and having these conversations, people out there aren't just hearing, how do I get a guardian for my child who's disabled? Or if I'm a person with disabilities, how do I get a guardian for me? So I've heard that question asked and sometimes, it's, well, maybe there's a less restrictive alternative. And maybe if that's part of the conversation, fewer people who don't actually need a guardian won't end up with one. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's the kind of a thing where you do hear once in a while that somebody has a guardian, really does not need a guardian, um, and is stuck maybe in, a, in a, a bind with somebody who's been appointed for them over a particular decision. And it's very hard to resolve after the fact. It's much easier to avoid in the first place. Um, so the documents that you're referencing, the written, the written documentation, is there ever, ever um, a reason for them to have um, to have to hold up legally for, for any reason. Um, would power of attorney ever come into play with these documents um, if someone's needs suddenly changed? Yeah, so a power of attorney is something that people, um, again, with or without disabilities, it's a tool that they might use. And New Jersey has some pretty specific requirements uh, for powers of attorney. They need to be written. There needs to be an appointment of somebody to act for you and a description of what authority they have to act on your behalf. Um, but that could be, Right? Because, again, because we don't have any particular framework, you could build a power of attorney into your supported decision-making arrangement. Maybe you want your communicator, the person who goes out and tells the world what you've decided. And, you, know, you, know, there's some, you know, there's some bias out there. Some doctors or some banks might not really like to hear from somebody who sounds like they have a disability. And you know, that, that's unjust, and that's unfair, but maybe you recognize that is and you decide to appoint a power of attorney, someone who can go with a document and say, I speak for... You know, Michael Brower, I'm his agent. And when I say he wants to open a bank account here, you know, it's like the words came out of his mouth. Um, so those documents do have a place. So do things like healthcare proxies. Um, again, these are documents that people with or without disabilities might use as a tool so that if they were ever to find themselves in an ability, a situation where they didn't have the ability to communicate what they want for themselves, um, their wishes might be documented, or at least somebody who can talk to doctors about what kind of treatment they might want is well documented. Um, there are free forums available from the New Jersey Department of Health to set up a healthcare proxy. If you don't have a healthcare proxy, whether you're a person with a disability or not, it's something that you should have because you never know when you walk out the front door, something hits you in the head 
And now all of a sudden you're in the hospital and nobody knows what kind of treatment you want. Having somebody designated to speak for you in that situation, or at least have your wishes documented so people know what you might want for yourself um, could save you from a lot of pain or anguish that you might not want or vice versa might help extend your life if that's what you would have wanted in that situation. Perfect. And can you talk a little bit also, right, um, for power of attorney, that is that individual granting that permission. Um, and they can actually revoke that permission. Is that correct? Um, guardian? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's one of the really powerful things about a power of attorney, and that makes it a little bit more flexible and less restrictive than a guardianship is, you know, we would call it a concurrent power. So, Melanie, for example, if I were to appoint you as my power of attorney, and I said, you're allowed to open bank accounts in my name, and you started opening bank accounts at Wells Fargo and Bank of America, and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second, too many, I could revoke your power of attorney, and I can take that power back from you. Or I could overrule particular decisions. Like, I don't want Bank of America. I just want Wells Fargo. I could overrule particular decisions. Um, and I would still have the authority there because I'm still the core of that decision-making arrangement to decide for myself. I don't give anything away permanently through a power of attorney. If you decided at some point that you thought I lacked the capacity to take that power back, you would have to go to court and ask the court to be appointed as guardian. Um, so there's a protection involved there with the power of attorney. and you know, we would call it a concurrent power. The individual who signs up for the power of attorney can always take that power back. Um, so we have someone asking with the prevalence of big medical groups versus independent doctors, are you finding that supportive decision-making arrangements are being honored by the medical professionals? It is very much a mixed bag. Uh, I have certainly had clients who um, you know, outwardly appeared to have a disability that affected their cognition and, you know, doctors didn't respect their decision to have even basic medical procedures performed. Uh, and that meant that these people couldn't get the medical care they needed to be healthy. Um, and on the other hand, I've had doctors who um, have affirmatively reached out to Disability Rights New Jersey to say, hey, I've got this like conflict between maybe it's a parent and a person who, again, appears to have a disability. You know, can you give me some technical advice? What's the law say about this? Um, and right, those doctors are clearly coming from a place where they want to respect the decision of an individual um, and not take the decision-making power away from them without some kind of a court order. Uh, it is a mixed bag though. It's a diverse state, you know, between North and South, you know, we have high income and low income areas, black and white, different languages. And there's a lot of cultures in New Jersey. And, you know, there's, you know, just the reality that some folks are just a little bit more conservatively minded and some are a little bit more liberal when it comes to the rights of people with disabilities. Um, it is a mixed bag. Um, I would say, though, if someone does run into a particular problem um, that they should reach out through intake to disability rights, we'd be interested in hearing about um, any problems people are having with getting an accommodation from a doctor or not having their decisions respected, um, you know, short of them having a guardianship. Great. Um, so, Michael, I know that we're running close on time. Can we get to three more questions? Let's, let's do them quick. Yeah, we can okay. do it. Okay. Um, any states that you could identify as doing this really well? So believe it or not, Texas is a leader uh, in supported decision making. And I guess it comes a little bit from their, you know, identity as a super, like a lone star, right? Like the individual in Texas always is the master. Um, so Texas got ahead of the game very early. Other states have started to jump on board more and more, um, but they seem to really be the ones that got first out of the gate um, with, you know, formalized agreement forms, formalized protections for doctors and banks and things like that when it comes to respecting the decisions of somebody with a disability and really trying to cut back on the number of guardianships that get filed there in the state. Uh, but they're just one example. There's a lot of states who have gotten on board recently. Great. Um, so let's get to one more question. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process or how challenging it is to go from full guardianship to supportive decisions? So it is hard. Um, it is very difficult. Unfortunately, once you have a guardianship in New Jersey, um, sometimes, and you know, there's a recent case I'm thinking about where even the guardian, the individual themselves, all the lawyers involved, all the individual's doctors and support professionals all agreed. This person no longer needed a guardian. They had it figured out. They had developed a really good supported decision-making agreement. And the judge in that case is just like, well, I don't know, it feels like it's risky and maybe something goes wrong and, and this will come back to me. 
um, there's there's momentum to be had here. And once a guardianship is there, um, judges can be a little hesitant to take those kind of protections out of the place and let the person really drive their own life with a supported decision-making arrangement. Um, that being said, um, with good documentation, lots of support, those kind of challenges can be overcome, but it's much, much better to avoid a guardianship in the first place if it's not really necessary. Um, so I know a lot of people are asking for a copy of the of this session. We will make sure to get that out um, over the next week, hopefully by the end of this week. Um, so please look for uh, a future email over the next few days uh, sharing that link to the recording. Um, everyone saw Michael's um, contact information through Disability Rights New Jersey. I know that Colleen's been um, putting in the chat section a box where people can download that presentation. So please, before we sign off today, just quickly click download. You'll find that um, a little bit higher up in the chat area. Again, um, Michael, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate this. Uh, the Community Living Education Project is really focused on providing information sessions such as the one that Michael did today uh, to really help um, educate um, allow individuals in the community to explore options and identify what's right for them. As we're getting ready to disconnect from the, today's session, you're going to see that a brief survey is going to pop up on your screen. It might take 30 seconds to uh, complete. We encourage you to do so. It's the information that you provide us that allows us to tailor future sessions. We do have another upcoming session on February 23rd with Mike Murata, also from Disability Rights New Jersey. He's going to be presenting on assistive technology for increased independence and community integration. So on behalf of the CLEP team, Disability Rights New Jersey, we would like to uh, thank you again for joining us today. Um, Michael, thank you again. Great. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Melanie, and thank you, everybody who participated. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk. Everyone take care and take it easy. You will. Thank you.